Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Ilaria Micheli. Ilaria is Associate Professor in African Languages and Linguistics at the Department of Legal, Language, Interpreting, and Translation Studies at the University of Trieste. Her interests include language documentation, medical anthropology, and development studies. Please join me in welcoming Ilaria as she gives her talk, Ogiek Orature, Exploring the Role of Oral Tradition in Unraveling the History and Language of a Hunter-Gatherer Community. Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation and thank you for being here. My theme today is the uh, Objek Orator. Uh, it's a project that is uh, now starting, even though uh, the corpus of which I'm going to speak uh, has been collected now 10 years ago. And um, the objective of this, uh, of this presentation is to try to explore the role of oral tradition in unraveling the history and language of a hunter-gatherer community. Um, as you see, this work is part of this uh, uh, project that is INALC, Investigating African Languages and Culture, and this is a project that has been promoted by the Italian Ministry of University and Research and funded by the EU with Next Generation EU program. So, uh, aim of this project is then to investigate how the study of oral tradition, both in terms of content and morphological and lexical features, can help the reconstruction of the ethno-linguistic and historical mosaic of remote areas of the world, such as those inhabited by hunter-gatherers. Historical reconstructions are always a difficult undertaking, but they become even more difficult when there is a lack of credible documentary evidence, such as chronicles, diaries, or archaeological artifacts. This lack of material is particularly pronounced in regions where hunter-gatherer communities live, such as in the forests of eastern Central Africa. Due to their ecological context and their dependence on simple technologies combined with the perishable nature of their materials, hunter-gatherer communities had limited interaction with the surrounding populations. They were often regarded as parasites by sedentary societies and treated with suspicion and contempt by indigenous kingdoms, colonial administrators, and post-independence governments. As a result, the history of undergatherers in Africa remained largely uh, unexplored. In such cases, the study of oral tradition can prove to be a valuable tool. Oral narratives, whether they report on the colonization of the region or serve, educational and recreational purposes provide valuable insights for the reconstruction of historical and cultural narratives. I will try to address the topic, exploring a corpus of 23 stories, seven songs, and two riddles collected during two research missions in 2014 and 2015 uh, from the Ogiek of Maria Shoni, a group of semi-nomadic undergatherers with a delayed return economy who live between the highlands and lowlands of the Mau Forest Escarpment in Kenya. Uh, so our path today will be uh, just to follow these um, four points. This who are the OGF, so a brief introduction about the population and their uh, linguistic classification. Then I will try to present the corpus and uh, try to give you um, a first overview of the data emerging from the analysis of the corpus itself. And then I will try to conclude trying to answer the, the first question that is, is it really useful to uh, investigate in oral tradition to, um, as a means for the reconstruction of the story of this uh, particular population, such as those of the Anther gatherers. So now what are the Ogiek? Uh, the Ogek of Maria Shonia are a population consisting of a constellation of semi nomadic clans of under gatherers embedded in a Kalenjin and partly in a Bantu context. In contrast to other under gatherers groups, the Ogek have a delayed return economy. In addition to procuring food for immediate consumption, they also uh, are traditionally beekeepers, producing a surplus of honey that can be used in times of greater need. 
This traditional practice has contributed to their need to move only at a certain times of the year and in certain directions in accordance with the migrations of the bee swarms, uh, which are influenced by environmental factors and the foraging opportunities of various flowering plants between the highlands and lowlands that characterize the areas of the eastern Mao forest escarpment between Molo, Kiptunga town and Lake Nafur. In general, the older informants for Maria Shoni told me of migrations that took place about twice a year and have become increasingly rare over the last 50 years due to the deforestation in the area. This deforestation has caused the Mao forest in Nakuru district to decline by more than 70% since the, uh, the 70s. Its uniqueness may indeed, be, may indeed be the reason for the need to regulate access and utilization rights to, to certain parts of the forest by the seven different clans of Morisioni, as shown in the maps of Mushemi and the Resperger Atlas of the Ogiek People's Ancest Ancestral Territories. Um, the link to the atlas, you can find it uh, here. And the, all the maps that you can see, uh, you can find them at page seven, uh, 6074. From a linguistic perspective, Okiek is a Kalenjin language belonging to the Southern Nilotic subgroup of the Eastern Sudanese branch of the Nilo-Saharan tribe. And here you see the distribution uh, of, um, of the Okiek between uh, Kenya and um, Tanzania, where the language is called Akie. And there are friends like uh, Krista Koenig, uh, Carsten Leger, and Bern uh, Heine, who are now uh, working very much on Diakie. Um, as you see here, where you see the, the uh, blue arrows, uh, you can find the Ogiek. Uh, and you see that the Ogiek uh, are surrounded by Bantu tribes. And you see here uh, in green, the Bantu tribes. And then you see Nandi and Kipsigis, who are very, very close uh, to them and whose languages are very related, very closely related with Ogiek and Akie. And then you see this enclave of uh, Maasai, who split in two parts the, the regions inhabited by the Ogiek in Kenya and then uh, the, the Akie in Tanzania. Uh, about the corpus, uh, the corpus consists of heterogeneous materials collected during two periods of fieldwork in the Maria Shoni area in January and February 2013 and 2014, so 10 years ago now. Uh, the corpus comprises seven songs, uh, which has been recorded with a group of women aged between 22 and 68 years, who are part of the volunteer group for the promotion and protection of object tangible and intangible culture, promoted by MACODEV, that is the Maria Shoni Community Development Program. Uh, which is an organization that has been established with the support of NECOFA Kenya, that is the Network for Eco Farming in Kenya, and Manitese, that is an Italian ONG. Then we have 23 stories, which were recorded with nine narrators aged between 40 and 80, who, come, who came from five different places in the region, namely Maria Shoni, Caprop, Ndosua, Kiptunga, and Molem. The group included only three women, one of whom grew up in a Kipsigis context. Then we have two readers that has been recorded with the oldest woman of the Maria Shoni community. Uh, worth noting is that it was impossible to record any proverbs. This is a feature the Ogiek share, for example, with another undergatherer tribe of East Africa, namely the Bashmen as documented by Doak in 1933 and by some nil other Nilotic peoples as documented in Evans Breach in 1963 and as reported in Finnegan 1970. All material well, were transcribed in the original language using, using an international phonetic alphabet for transcription for the publication that is planned for next year, so 2025, I hope, I will probably adopt the orthography implemented by the Bible translation projects uh, of the seal. This orthography, orthography has already been used in some recent books that are downloadable for free from the Bloom Library. Then I will uh, show you also the, um, the link to these uh, books. 
The translation was done with the help of a local interpreter, Catherine Czepko Exalin, the daughter of the village head of Maria Shoni. Catherine is a self-confident woman who has completed her studies until uh, the university degree, and she is now seeking for a PhD and currently lives in the city of Nairobi. About the songs, then at the end of the presentation, I will uh, um, make you listen to one of these songs. Um, these songs are, most cheerful, are uh, mostly cheerful songs that are sung at festive and important occasions, such as weddings, big hunts, or the presentation of a newborn to the community. Um, one of the most significant songs is part uh, of the traditional heritage of semi-ritual songs uh, sung by girls immediately after their circumcision when they are presented to the male community, including those men from non-Ogiek communities such as Masai, Nandi, and Kipsikis, uh, who choose their brides from among the Ogiek. Here you have uh, a part of the text of this special song, because I think that uh, this is the, small, the most significant song in terms of research aimed to the study of the uh, history of, um, of the region. In this song, uh, in which the women proudly describe all the features of the Ogiek territory and culture, you see here, uh, they say, um, for example, uh, welcome down here where it is very cold, uh, here down it is very cold, but sweet are the waters because uh, the Maria Shoni region, the Kiptunga forest, uh, is the region where, where um, you have all the sources that go uh, to, to uh, nourish like Napuru. So uh, this is the um, water castle, the most important water castle of Kenya. Um, and then you have this part where you can see we come from where it cannot be explained. Uh, to, explain, to explain our path, we need one thing. What is this thing? Is, it cannot be explained. So they say in a way uh, that they have a, a particular history, but this history is secretated in a way. So nobody can know uh, where they come from. Uh, again, another part of the story say, of the song says, we come from our land, but they really do not uh, mention where this land uh, is located. Uh, again, also in the details, you, you will see there is no, um, no reference to a specific um, origin of the Ogiek. And then we will discuss this later on. From an anthropological point of view, one could interpret this, retic this reticence in, in indicating a peculiar uh, specific place where they come from. Uh, as the admission that the Ogiek people were born from the fusion of different scattered groups of a general Karangin origin that in the past left their lands due to possible, to possible turbulence or periods of famine and drought and sought refuge in the forest. So probably they originated from different groups uh, coming from different um, ethnic uh, populations. Indeed, as it happens with other undergathered communities around the world, in their tales, there seem to be no symbolic evidence pointing to an autochthonous uh, and autonomous descendants. That is, I, I didn't find uh, any, um, any tale or any story that refers to the first pay, the pair of Ogiek that climbs out of a cave uh, or that comes out of the ground or that descends from uh, a totemic animal living in that region or the like. Be it as it may, further research on this point would, would be more than welcome and could help shed light on this very intricate topic. The content of the taste that's, does not primar primarily concern the history of the settlement of the region or the recording of events considered significant by the community. The storytellers were left free to tell the, their stories they considered most representative of their oral, oral heritage. Thus, apart from only two mythological or historical stories, all others were of a playful or educational nature. It, it is interesting to note that the Ogiek entertain, entertainment stories have little in common with the more familiar African tradition common among the, ba the Bantu communities of East Africa or the Akan communities of West Africa, in which animals often play the leading role. In fact, the Ogiek tales can be divided into four main groups, 
which can be summarized as follows. Uh, one, stories that tell of the relationships between the object and the supernatural world. And for this group, I collected eight tales. Then stories that describe often ironically the relations between the object and the neighboring people, especially the Maasai. And in this case, I have three tales for this group. Then you have stories that tell of the relationships between the object themselves, being among, among different clans of the object. And in this case, I have seven tales. And then stories that tell of the relationships between the object and the animals of the forest. And in this case, I have five tales. The only story in which the protagonists are animals with, with anthropomorphic features is a narrative common to Bantu, to Bantu heritage. I personally believe that it represents less of a true Bantu influence on the object oral tradition and more of a unique event. This because the narrator was the only woman who grew up in a Kipsigis context and had an education. She was in fact a former primary school teacher who wanted to recite a story that was probably in the textbooks, presenting it as a traditional Yogyak uh, story, even though it evidently was not a traditional Yogyak story. No other storyteller had in fact ever heard of these or other similar stories. As for the two riddles, they are interesting composition, especially in terms of their unique rhythmic and stylistic structure. Uh, they all, both of them refer to, to beekeeping and to the life of bees. Uh, and it would be very interesting in the future uh, to try to collect other riddles, just to see if the, all the riddles refer to bees and beekeeping, or if there is even uh, something different. Uh, for the analysis of the corpus, we have these three uh, main research questions. Uh, how many different peoples are overtly mentioned uh, in the corpus? And, uh, and if they occur, are the episodes referring to them somehow datable? Then how many long words, single words, or word sequences from different languages appear in the corpus? And which languages do they come from? And then, Last, uh, the last question, does linguistic proximity go hand in hand with cultural proximity? Now, how many different people? Regarding the first point, the analysis of the material has shown that the population groups directly mentioned in the corpus are five. Kipchoik, Maasai, Kipsikis, Nandi, and Kikuyu. The only ones mentioned more than once are the Maasai with eight occurrences, while all others occur only once. Although the ethnonym appears only once in the text, the Kipshoig, that is the first, uh, the first uh, population, together with the object, are the protagonists of the entire third story, which we refer to as enemies. So the title of this third story is Enemies. Uh, and this, uh, this title has been suggested by the narrator himself. According to this narrative, the Kipshoik are the most feared enemies of the Ogiek. This issue, this issue could almost go unnoticed, uh, where if not for the fact that the ethno-linguistic maps of the region do not mention any population with this name. But history teaches us that the words of our interlocutors on the ground must always be taken seriously, even if they are to be severed with a grain of salt. So there must be, or at least have been, a community distinct from the Ogiek, or perhaps simply the Ogiek of Maria Shoni, that can be identified by this ethnonym. Could it be a clan of the Ogiek from another family? Probably, yes. If you stick to the framework pro provided by the Ogiek and ancestral territories, the, the name of the Kapshoi, so not Kipshoi, but Kapshoi clan appears. Again, Lablet as Kapshoi with the um, Velar stop voiceless, Kapshoi, in the maps and belonging to the Chepke Rerwek family. That is another clan of Ogiek, not the Morisionic clan, but another Ogiek clan. Looking at the dialectal variants of Ogiek, the prefix Kip, which is typically used in the Maria Shoni dialect to form ethnonyms, appears to be regularly replaced in the Chepkwererek variant by the prefix cap, which is also common in another 
uh, Kalenjin language, such as Nandi. In addition, the plural suffix ik is often realized with an aspirate. So it could be that uh, what was recorded in the atlas uh, as the final morpheme oi is actually an oi with an aspirate. At this point, based on the form of the word, of the word, it could be plausible that our Kapshoi, pronounced in the Mariashoni dialect variants, become Kipshoik. From this, one could conclude that the most feared enemies, namely the population with whom the Mariashoni Ogiek have had and still have the bloodiest conflicts, are in fact clans similar to them and belonging to other families with whom the bonds of solidarity and reciprocity within the Mauritianic family do not apply unless they have to unite against um, to unite against an external invader that threatens both, both macro groups, that is, the Tiepkerere and uh, the Morisionic. Uh, all these would correspond exactly to what, to what classical anthropology teaches us about the relationships within populations composed of different clans, each divided into precise lineages and presents a very plausible picture of the internal balances within the three Okiek families considered as a unified people. Now, for what concerns the Maasai, they appear in three different stories in which both bloody and humorous episodes are told, in which the Okiek, although poorer and less well-armed, skillfully outmaneuver their wealthier but, but less intelligent opponents. Specifically, in story two, the narrator mentions as the Tiemosit, the orcs living in the forest, deceive the Ogiek by taking on the appearance of the Maasai. That is, in this story, uh, we have a superposition of a supernatural um, element that is, that is the Tiemosit, which is the, um, the most feared um, orc living in the forest on the Maasai tribe. That is, the Maasai are um, equal in this story uh, to the Tiemosit. In story seven, the narrator mentions instead that the Maasai were the Ogiek's historical neighbors long before other peoples invaded the Mau forest region. In story 15, in which the ethnonym Maasai appears six times, a specific and exemplary episode is told, in which there are repeated clashes between a group of Maasai invaders and the brave Ogiek warrior Tiebkereriot. This is the name of the, of the warrior. There was a time when Yogyak and the Maasai lived as neighbors, each inhabiting their own space and maintaining peaceful relations with each other. One day, however, the Maasai made a night raid on the Yogyak territory and killed most of the men who were keeping watch by catching them sleeping under the trees outside the camp. Tiepke Reriot, the son of one of the Yogyak killed that night, took revenge the next day. He killed all the Maasai men he encountered and continued his vendetta in the days that followed. The Maasai were unable to prevent or stop the bloodshed until finally Maasai women approached him and pleaded for peace and a ceasefire on behalf of, of their people. They assured him that such an attack which had triggered such violence would not happen again. Tiepke Reriot accepted the woman's apology and the violence stopped. In story seven, Nandi, Kipsigis, and Kikuyu, as well as Asian and white men, are mentioned only once. It is said that Yogyak and the Tiemosit, the giants of the forest, had not yet entered the Mariasioni region at the time of the events narrated. Although this information is undated, it is of crucial importance for the settlement of uh, for the settlement history of the region. The Maasai are mentioned here as the Ogiek legitim, uh, legitimate neighbors. The exchanges and coexistence between the Ogiek and the Maasai was thus evidently not only real, but also primary as compared to all other groups who are considered intruders just like Asians or whites. Specifically, the narrator mentions Nandi and Kipsigis while describing the context and stating that at the time of the events, Kimangeti Korega Susuek, Korega Susuek, Kogimango Bogiek, Korega Susuek, Kogimo Bun, Emetog Nandien Kipsigise, Koechek Kogi Korega Teleg Negikirupwe. That means there were no houses made of straw. Houses made of straw were not for the Ogiek. 
houses made of straw came from the Nandi and Kipsigis area. There we had houses made of bamboo leaves in which we slept. As for the Kikuyu, they are mentioned later in the narrative. Maketing Sugul, Mangeneng Chiege, Metosko Goljoti, Kipsigis Indoni, Chumindoni, Moendioni, Chitone Gibom, Kokwet Nyong, Kogigmo Soindet which means we had no schools, we didn't know anyone like the Kikuyu. These Kipsigis, whites, Asians, someone, were our neighbors, was, uh, were the Maasai. None of the events referred to in the 23 texts can be dated more precisely uh, than mentioned above. That is, we, we do not have any idea uh, of the specific historical um, uh, sequence of the events, but we just come to know that the object the Maasai were there before the arrival of the Kipsigis and the Nandi uh, in the region. Uh, as for the second point, the borrowings recorded in the corpus are indeed few, apart from the fact that three of the 23 stories were so heavily influenced by Kipsigis that, that the translator was forced to make a genuine rephrasing of the content, of the content from Kipsigis to Ogiek before transcribing. To summarize, the borrowings are as follows. The, uh, 32 from Kipsigis, 24 from Kiswahili, two from English and two of unknown origin. Since both the borrowings from Swahili and those from English do not, do not really have a corresponding translation in Ogiek and mostly consist of compound structure or refer to objects or words that are foreign to Ogiek, such as numbers uh, above 10 or even ideophones, they are not considered for the tables I will present uh, in the slides. Focusing on the Kipsigin's loans for brevity in, in the table here, I just report the most significant Kipsigin morphological structures that appear to be commonly, ac commonly accepted by Ogiek speaker, even though they correctly identify them as non ogiek so here you see um, in bold the morphological part that is different in Kipsigis and in Ogiek. Uh, the, first, the, 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 the morpheme that you see in the column uh, named as Kipsigis uh, are the forms that have been recorded in, this, in the tales. And then the other version that, the, that is uh, the, the correct Ogiek version with the correct Ogiek morpheme uh, has been reported, has been discussed later on with the, uh, with the translator. Uh, what is interesting here is that we have four occurrences in which this, uh, um, in which this Kipsigis A morpheme, uh, which has a value of repetitiveness or purpose uh, in the uh, verb formation. Then we have this mot that is uh, the Kipsigis um, morpheme for, uh, for uh, the negative structure, uh, while the Ogiek, the Akie, and also the Nandi use this other morpheme, A uh, or Ma, uh, for the formation of, um, of this negative uh, form. And then you have, we have two uh, personal pronouns and then a focus particle uh, that has been correctly corrected uh, by uh, the translator in the right uh, Ogiek form. Uh, in this uh, slide, instead, you see the list of Kipsigis lexical borrowings. Uh, as you see in uh, just two um, occurrences, that is pig versus pig or kochorugu versus kokchorugu, um, the, the, the difference is also in terms of phonology. While in all the others, uh, in all the other words, uh, the difference is uh, really to be found in the root of the of the word it, of the word itself. So um, in this case, the lexical borrowings are very interesting. Uh, the most interesting for me is this otindion, that is the, the one which appears uh, as the first that I mentioned, uh, because in in this uh, corpus of tales, that is uh, an Ogiek corpus, the name used for tale uh, was otindion, and non and not tonguch, which is the real um, Ogiek form. So otindion is 
um, this, this word that is commonly used in Kipsigis and which appears also in other uh, Kalenjin languages as uh, the translation uh, of Te. Uh, another very interesting um, uh, borrowing here is onsnet, that is the Kipsigis term for uh, forest, when we have two voices in uh, two, two names, two words uh, in uh, Ogiet, Timdo and the Met, uh, which indicates two uh, different kinds of forests. Timdo is the very, very um, poor forest, that is the, the, the most uh, intricate one, and a Met is the forest where uh, um, hunters go to hunt and which is closer uh, to the uh, settlements. Uh, but this Osnet uh, is, is an interesting borrowing because uh, it derives from a language such as Kipsigis, which is spoken by uh, farmers uh, and not uh, by, by others gatherers. And we are now uh, analyzing a corpus made uh, by uh, under gatherers people. So uh, this uh, is, according to me, uh, quite interesting. Anyway, the translator was able to disambiguate the meaning of both morphological and lexical borrowings without any problems, and only in two cases she was uncertain and could not find an adequate equivalent in Ogiek. Now, concerning the, the, the last research question, no, uh, does linguistic proximity go hand in hand with cultural proximity? Just to summarize, no. Um, Looking at uh, their cultural identity, is, it is evident that the Ogiek, who are semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers, have, li have little or nothing in common in terms of productive activities, technology, practices, and beliefs be with people such as the Kipsigis or Nandi, who are sedentary farmers. However, according to reports by Antin Ford, um, 1927, 1931, 1955, and 1972, some Ogiek groups began raising sheep in the 20s uh, when their contacts with the Nandi became more frequent, and they now tend to use sheep as luxury item for spousal exchange and for the prestige that comes with owning and many animals. The Nandi, like the Ogiek, place great value on honey production, and beehives are among the assets passed down from father to son. However, these are examples of a relatively recent commonality, a commonality that is too recent to justify such a market linguistic similarity, both in terms of vocabulary and especially morphology. Linguistic similarity or linguistic closeness that, that can be uh, explained uh, if we think that uh, effectively the object could have been formed as, a as an ethnic group by these scattered groups of uh, sedentary farmers who in ancient times left their communities and find refuge uh, in the forest, creating a composite group living now uh, in, the, in the forest. Furthermore, despite the long-standing parasitic relationship between the Ogiek and the Maasai, who until recently called them Dorobo, that is servants, and despite the transfer of women from the Ogiek to the Maasai, there is no evidence of linguistic exchange between the two groups. Finally, many Ogiek who used to live near Maasai communities in a rock district decided to settle in the region and seek Maasai hospitality in the 70s, when they saw that the Mao forest was rapid, rapidly diminishing. However, this process did not lead to cultural or linguistic contamination, but rather to the Ogiek abandoning their own language and culture in favor of the unquestioned and complete adoption of Maasai language, culture, and practices. Just to conclude, to summarize as expected, the analysis of the corpus collected in the Maria Shoni region does not provide precise chronological information about historical events. However, it offers a fairly accurate picture of the power plays and economic and social relations between the different ethnic groups inhabiting these remote areas of the Mao forest escarpment, stretching between the Narok district, Lei Nakuru, and the Kiptunga forest plateaus. The morphological analysis of the corpus confirms a very close relationship within the Kalenjin family between Nandi, Kipsigis, and Okie. The lexical analysis confirms a clear closeness between Ogiek and Kipsigis to such an extent that one of the narrators peppered these stories with words and phrases from Kipsigis that the translator, despite his perfect understanding of his fellow's discourse, 
felt the need to rephrase into normal object. As far as the context of the stories is concerned, they essentially confirm the actual isolation of the object of Maria Shoni from the other sedentary farmers in the region, Nandi and Kipsigis. Unlike the Maasai and the Kapchoi group, which as mentioned above, could plausibly be an Oyek clan belonging to the Tiepkwerereg family, Kipsigis and Nandi never appear in the stories as characters, but they are merely mentioned uh, when they discussed who were there before um, uh, the other. This would lead, that, would lead us to confirm that the Kipsigis and Nandi came to the Maria Shoni region after the Ogek settlement. The stories and song confirm the practice of exogamy. It is the passing of Ogek women to neighboring population, while the fact that only one woman who grew up, who grew up in a Kipsigis context was reportedly married to an Ogyot from Maria Shoni suggests that the reverse practice is not currently common. That is, uh, no women usually come to the Ogiek um, group coming from the Maasai or the Nandi or um, other Kalenjin uh, population. This means that the Ogiek are economically and politically inferior in the ethnic fabric of the region, not only in relation to the nomadic Maasai pastoralists of whom we know the Ogiek formed a parasite community, but also in relation to, to everyone else living uh, in the region. So uh, I stop here, but uh, if you want to hear some uh, true uh, Ogiek, uh, I ask Andrew to, um, to make the song sound. <laughs> Do you have anything you would like to say about that particular song um, okay. now that we've listened to it? Yes, this is the song that I presented. That is the song that uh, the women sing when the um, girls' circumcision has been uh, has, has been finished, and they are presenting the girls for the marriage for 
uh, in front of the men who can choose uh, their brides uh, among the girls. And what is interesting that is that this asaigo that you uh, that you hear uh, is a welcoming um, greeting. And uh, here uh, in this song, you see that they um, present the region of the Ogyek and the Ogyek themselves as, as uh, very proud people. They are very proud uh, of their territories, of the fact that they have. Uh, fresh waters, because as I said to you, uh, they live in this uh, region, which is the uh, water, the, the major water castle of Kenya. So they have many sources, and the, and really uh, the springs, the, the 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 waters are very very fresh and very very clean. Uh, but then at the end of this so this uh, song, you see the last line: uh, "We come from uh, from from our land. Those who come from here, they are the champions who run." Uh, this is very interesting because it is a modern uh, adding uh, to the song uh, in which they show that they are um, very, very proud of those uh, Ogiek or those Kalenjin people uh, who are those who, who win uh, usually the marathons uh, all around the world. And uh, okay, so they record this uh, small uh, event also in this traditional song extending uh, this, uh, this tradition with uh, the other things that uh, they are proud of. So thank you so much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be opened to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question, that is also still possible. You can do so using the Zoom chat module and I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Go ahead, Bunny. Thanks so much for such a great talk, Ilaria. It's very Thank fun. <laughs> and I'm sure uh, Andrew will agree that that song kind of was a little reminiscent of some Hadza songs with the uh, lead single voice and then the chorus in the back. Um, but uh, I wanted to comment, and maybe Andrew does too, about the riddles. Uh, we were working riddles in the Rift Valley, and yeah, we did not see any hunter-gatherer groups that had riddles. So it's interesting in that, I suppose, has something to do with their delayed return economy. And and this is true of uh, hunter-gatherer groups in the Kalahari either, just not seeing riddles, any of those uh, groups. So um, I wondered if we wanted to share those riddles with us. Uh, we know the answer is something to do with bees, but. So because it's, it's uh, effectively very, very interesting. It was just two riddles that I could collect. I tried to to find others, but uh, I just. And but in fact, only I, give the us only... the questions first. Don't give right. us the answers. Right. But we I'm have a pretty good hint, guess though. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with Khoisan languages, uh, we we found proverbs with the uh, uh, Nama, but of course they're pastoralists. So, you know, even, I don't think it's a, a language affiliation thing, but a cultural thing. In this moment, I cannot find the, the readers because it was not in the presentation. That's I fine. Can, we'll, uh, can send you can send us an email 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 later on, I, yeah. I will send you by email, sorry. But, but, but can you say what they were like? Were there a whole story or just one line? One no, no, sentence? no, no, uh, four, three, four lines, three, four lines. Uh, it was question and answer. And the question was, uh, are the, the two questions, because the, in the two, the two readers are made uh, in the same uh, way. So uh, there is this question and then the answer. Uh, the answer is also, in one case, it is the queen bee. And in the other case, I don't remember if it refers to a specific kind of honey or something like that. But anyway, the structure is question and answer and a uh, couple of lines. And it has a rhythmic, um, a rhythmic value that is very, very interesting. But it was impossible for me to find, because it, uh, it was uh, really intriguing, you know, because two readers and both of them uh, on the uh, question of uh, bees and beekeeping, and I tried really to find another find other examples uh, which were not bound to uh, the word of bees, and uh, it was really impossible. Andrew, 
first of all, thank you for the uh, talk. Um, uh, I have to admit, I don't know much about the um, uh, the uh, Ogiek, and I think it's um, I think it's really interesting just to kind of think about uh, this this uh, this lifestyle of transhumans, but not with cattle, but with bees. I think it's really it's a really interesting thing to think about people moving twice a year to follow the bees. I think it's incredible. I was wondering. Uh, if there is much modern organized religion among the Ogiek these days? Okay, yes, because the, the, the uh, Christians of, I don't know which kind of uh, Christian church, uh, but they are bound to the seal. So because seal is working very much in the, uh, in the translation of uh, some parts of the Bible. And also the book of the Bloom Library derived from the BTL uh, activities. So uh, there are, above all, in the in the region of Narot, that is uh, southwards with respect to Maria Shoni, uh, there they they really are very very much present with these kind of uh, churches. While in Maria Shoni and especially Kiptunga, which is the inside very in the very inside of the forest, uh, there. I think they um, they no, do not have contacts with uh, with these churches, and uh, in terms of religion, the the name of the main god uh, that that I could uh, record is Asista, uh, which is always the same, always the same. That, but that, would, that <laughs> rings a bell with people who are familiar with with Nilotic people in Tanzania, right? Because you have Aseta for the for the Datoga yeah. deity. Uh, associated with the sun. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a sun deity. Yeah. Um, the reason that I ask about the about the modern uh, religion and uh, is uh, immediately sort of when I heard the song, I thought, oh, it sounds a little bit like a Christian song uh, mm -hmm. with the call and response. Uh, though Bonnie is right, um, there there is there is some call and response stuff with with Hadza music as well. But uh, the the um, the way that this sounded to me with the harmonies and things sounded very much like a, like a, like a, um, like a worship song. You and know, I don't think so because, um, because all this, all the seven songs, all the songs are made in, in the same way. That is, there is the, the person and then the chorus. Um, and, uh, what is interesting is that of these seven songs, uh, I have this one that is, uh, the, the, circumcision of for the girls and then there is another one uh, which is for the circumcision of the males uh, then i have uh, two um, songs for babies that is um, both the first one van ma's song uh, is like a lullaby and the other one uh, is the the song that they sing for the presentation of the baby to the community so uh, they are very, very significant in terms of cultural uh, uh, situation when they are performed. Uh, then I have two, uh, two very interesting, another two very interesting story uh, songs uh, that are kind of um, don't know how to to, to tell it. In um, they, they they look like anthem because they speak of the Maria Shoni people. Uh, and um, they express this proudness of being uh, Morisionic. So they, they look like anthem that they could call, uh, that, that they could sing uh, before big hands or before uh, um, clashes or something like that. And they look like this. And then the, the last one is another joyful song that is uh, sung during weddings. And again, it is made in the same way. That is, there is uh, the, the solist and then the chorus. Yeah. Welcome. I also wanted to say thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, and my question is actually about your hypothesis on the history of the people, because you say that you assume that they were farmers and then they um, decided to retreat into the forest and they isolated themselves. What makes you think? Mm, that there was no other contact involved. I'm thinking of what do you, do you stumble upon anything that hints toward or uh, suggests that he did not meet hunter-gatherers and then it was kind of a, a combination of, of two groups. 
Uh, well, I, I don't have uh, a, a true answer for this, of course, because until um, until 10 years ago, I, I thought they were an independent group. Uh, but then analyzing their language, analyzing with, with Carson Leger, the Akie language, analyzing some parts of the Nandi and Kipsigis uh, description and so on, uh, you see that the similarities are really very, very, uh, very high. And also the fact that when a Kipsigis speak, uh, speaks in Kipsigis, the Ogek understand quite well uh, what the Kipsigis say, and the reverse is true. Um, it is clear that there is a continuum. Uh, and it is very, very strange that this continuum in terms of languages um, is not reflected in a continuum in terms of culture, that is technologies and whatever. And this, this, these observations together with the fact that in the tales, the, the storytellers were left uh, really free to tell me uh, the most significant stories of their uh, of their culture, and nobody, no one of them, uh, ever told me a story referring to uh, the fact that they were original from the Mount Forest or whatever. Uh, maybe this is also because they are migrating from the, the north to, 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 the, to, to, to the northern parts, to the southern parts of the forest and whatever. But there is no uh, this kind of uh, stories that say, for example, they came out uh, from the ground, they came out from a cave, they came out. So the the, the normal, you no, know, the traditional mythological stories that say, okay, these are the uh, first inhabitants of the of the region. Uh, but of course, this is a sensation for the moment because I I really do not have any kind of historical document uh, in terms of uh, other data uh, that are not these that, that, that I am explaining to you now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, could I ask one follow-up question? Um, because I know um, that um, Heine and König and Leger, they have a story of the Akia where they speak about how they became hunter-gatherers and it involves um, the Maasai as well, and um, uh, they follow the honey diet, and then they uh, lose their cattle, and then they become hunter-gatherers. Did you find anything um, comparable uh, for the Arctic? Okay, so probably uh, it, it would be interesting to see this uh, this uh, this part of the story. I have the book by Chris Dain uh, Burns, by I, I, but for the moment I did not have the, the time to go through it, so. Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Ilaria again for her presentation and everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar by Yeroen van Ravenhorst and Nicholas Lotman entitled Revitalizing Documentary Archives, Exploring Methods of Digital Distribution on Wednesday, the 29th of May.